Welcome back to our third session, From Ambition to Action, Navigating Corporate Climate Journey. To begin the session, it is with great pleasure to have Mr. Hendrik Rosenthal, Director of Group Sustainability at CLP Holdings Limited, to deliver his keynote speech on unlocking the potential of corporate climate action. Mr. Rosenthal, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me well and uh, all, the, um, all, all the digital uh, assistance we have these days is working just fine. And um, I just wanted to share a few things um, this afternoon in terms of CLP's climate ambition um, and, and how we go about um, making sure that we, we follow through with what we commit to. Um, so yeah, it's really uh, just a big thank you for, for having us join, for letting us join this afternoon. And I, I just, um, I just wanna um, share some ideas we could probably perhaps use to start uh, the discussion afterwards as part of the panel. And um, if you could just go to the next slide in terms of really um, just uh, wanted to outline our step-by-step -step approach that we've had here uh, at CLP over um, many years now. We've had a climate vision uh, since 2007. And this is really primarily because of the recognition that climate change and our carbon footprint as an electric utility is really very much central to our business. And that's from the perspective of um, where we have impacts, obviously impacts on, on the environment, on our global climate uh, from a carbon emissions perspective, but also the flip side of that being an, uh, where there is impacts on us, um, on our business, on our ability to continue to operate as we do, or on our real um, sort of uh, understanding that we perhaps also need to shift our own business in order to preserve enterprise value. Um, we were one of the first utilities in Asia, if not the first, to actually set ourselves a carbon or a greenhouse gas intensity target. And um, we've over the years um, committed to continue to strengthen these. So what you see here on this slide is really five different versions year by year. The first one, as mentioned in 2007, until um, the most recent one that we just published before COP26 um, last September. And it is really a commitment to gradually strengthen and tighten our targets. And we've documented that uh, quite clearly over the years in terms of how we want to go about achieving that. If I can move on to the, to the next slide in terms of uh, really outlining perhaps, uh, I just wanna showcase that this isn't really, this isn't just a document, this isn't just a brochure of sorts that uh, outlines some sort of climate vision uh, or ambition, it is really a, a business plan um, that we've developed uh, with our businesses from with a bottom-up approach, but also very much a, a top-down approach in terms of setting direction for each of the operating businesses that we have in the region here in Asia Pacific uh, to set the tone of, of where we want to be, where we need to be. Um, we uh, went through a, a rather lengthy process last uh, before we published the last version, uh, uh, in, as mentioned back in September, uh, which took just about a year to, to get us to this line here, what you see on this graph, this decarbonization trajectory that we outlined here is, um, is more than just a, a graph. It is really a representation of how we intend to shift the business uh, uh, for each of the markets where we have uh, uh, generating assets and um, really listening to them in terms of what's possible, what's feasible, what they had in mind, um, and then feeding that back to the senior management via our sustainability executive committee for uh, consideration and for um, direction back to the businesses in terms of what is it that we should uh, be striving towards. We um, also deliberated the various options at the board level sustainability committee. Um, and so, yeah, this was really quite uh, a bit of uh, engagement and, uh, and checking and, and, and mapping various scenarios in terms of how we could uh, change the business all the way to 2050. 
Um, finally, this uh, trajectory received approval from the CLP Holdings Board uh, before we went public with this new commitment. The new commitment being really um, that we've committed to a science-based target for 2030, and that is validated by the science-based target initiative uh, at a well below two degree trajectory. Um, we've kept the same pace um, of the well below two degree, two degree trajectory for 2040. Uh, we committed to phasing out all our coal assets by 2040. And that was um, a big shift in terms of uh, us doing this 10 years earlier than we had previously pledged. And then to finish uh, by 2050 with a net zero commitment across our value chain. Um, so we, we also very much recognize that this is a uh, well below two degree trajectory. Uh, we are not yet. Um, uh, in line with a 1.5 degree commitment, but we have indeed uh, continued to commit ourselves to review this no less than every five years. And um, we are already discussing now this year again in terms of how we should perhaps strengthen some of this or uh, add additional layers of targets that really demonstrate our commitment to, to get to the 1.5 degree um, trajectory over time. If I can move to the next slide, um, where it just uh, sort of perhaps speaks for itself in terms of um, our earnings and how they, they shift over time. It isn't just what I'm describing here, a, a what some people may call a climate strategy or a sustainability strategy. It is really a business strategy that has sustainability or climate considerations built in. Uh, more than three quarters of our earnings in 21, um, just the last fiscal year, were from non-carbon emitting sources, uh, including our tr uh, transmission distribution business, our retail side, and other non-generating activities. So that in itself, um, I think, speaks to the, the really changing nature of our business and the focus that we have in terms of really getting to the bottom line based on non-carbon emitting sources and, and not relying on the high intensity carbon to, uh, to meet our um, uh, financial objectives. On the next slide, I wanted to share a little bit in terms of what that actually means in practice. And uh, if you were in the auditorium or tuned in a little bit earlier, you saw a number of different videos from our uh, the sponsors for this event, including uh, our CLP video, which actually described uh, uh, and, and showed in, in a few more details these different projects that we have on the go uh, on the go here in Hong Kong. But primarily, our objective is really about phasing out coal from our power generation in the short to medium term, um, and then shifting our business in the long term to rely on. Um, well, shifting first of all to natural gas, but then over in the long term, really shifting to a, a source of zero carbon electricity that includes green hydrogen or energy storage solutions, and just a much more wider deployment of renewables. And what you see here uh, on these pictures is our, our new uh, gas unit, um, D1 at Black Point, and there's a second one being constructed at the moment. We are building infrastructure to receive natural gas uh, from the global markets. Um, we have made investments to utilize landfill gas here in Hong Kong to generate electricity. And we are making headway with um, deploying an offshore wind farm um, here in Hong Kong waters. And all that's part and parcel of uh, the overall strategy. Um, but it's the, that's still, you know, we do have that recognition that doesn't bring us yet to zero carbon electricity here in Hong Kong, but it is a step in the right direction, and we are working towards then shifting that to um, uh, zero carbon electricity, primarily based on, on green hydrogen. On the next slide, um, I just wanted to outline also a, a, an additional point that we feel is increasingly becoming important for us. And it isn't just focusing on our own emissions, our own scope one emissions, where we very much recognize that that's what we need to work on, that the electricity that we send out to customers and the carbon intensity of that, it is also very much about how we support our customers to decarbonize. 
Um, we see a number of opportunities for us in that space, and this is something we quite rigorously pursue, and it is part of our um, utility of the future vision, um, where we really focusing where we focus on energy as a service, whether that's cooling or EV charging infrastructure, battery storage, even um, our feed-in tariff scheme and the rooftop solar uh, piece that is on parcel of that here in Hong Kong is creating opportunities for us. Um, and uh, we're also looking at uh, shifting towards supporting uh, green data centers and uh, really focusing on uh, adding cooling or district cooling as part of our offering here in the Hong Kong market. And all that has a, a certain carbon footprint within our customer base, within our scope three, actually, that we uh, very much want to support. Uh, so that's our scope three. That's everyone else's, that's your scope two, essentially. So we were helping from that perspective also to reduce our customer scope two, not just by um, um, lowering the actual electricity carbon intensity that we send to you as a customer, but also enabling the more efficient utilization of that of each of those electrons that we send to make sure there is no wastage and that we optimize that as much as possible. And that's really uh, what comes together here in terms of us driving our climate action. And if I could move um, to the next slide, and I just wanted to quickly outline this. Um, we have a fairly extensive reporting suite at CLP, and, uh, and it isn't really just for the sake of reporting. Um, and uh, we obviously are doing quite a bit of uh, implementation as I hopefully just managed to portray and, and illustrate for you. But um, the reporting itself is very important from the perspective of tracking and benchmarking our progress against the targets. Um, we had done a fairly extensive review last year in terms of how do we communicate that um, and um, where we uh, had taking a, a newer approach in terms of what is it that we should showcase in each of these reports, our annual report, uh, the, an, the annual financial report, the sustainability report, uh, how do we divide out the actual content of, of each of those in terms of um, what is it that we want to showcase there. And uh, for the annual report, obviously that's very much for the investment for the uh, community. And we've taken an approach there based on a double materiality approach to really have that much more focused on, on enterprise value. So from a sustainability perspective, from an ESG perspective, how, does, how do these ESG risks and opportunities that we have as part of our, our business, how do they shape enterprise value? And that's what we try to, um, try to illustrate in the annual report versus the sustainability report then being much more focused on where do we have impacts as an organization and how do we minimize and mitigate that impact? And what have we done to, to optimize our performance either from a, a people perspective, from an environment perspective, or just at the broader market that we operate in. And then on top of that, of course, given the, uh, as mentioned already, the, the, the big focus for us is an electric utility on climate. We had then separately also published a climate related disclosures report, which is very much in reference to TCFD and, and the um, ISSB prototype that was already available uh, last year. So this is just to illustrate to some extent um, in terms of what we do from a practical perspective, but also from a disclosure perspective. And if I can just close with the, the next slide, uh, ultimately this is really um, about, about this beautiful place that we live in. I mean, today is perhaps not a sunny day, I appreciate that, but we do um, have these beautiful sunny days in Hong Kong and looking across the harbor or in my background here in Plover Cove, um, it is something that I think we all need to keep in mind of, of where we live and, and how we want this place to be and thrive and, and, uh, and feel from, a, um, from an environmental perspective. And um, all these things that we do uh, as organizations have impact um, uh, and, and that impact needs to be recognized, it needs to be understood, it needs to be managed, but ultimately it's also about your own business being managed and being able to thrive in this community and, and, and within the markets that you operate in. 
So it's really fundamentally, when you talk about sustainability or climate action or ambition uh, from a corporate perspective, it's, it's, we're, talking about, we're talking about business strategy, actually, right? It's how do we manage our risks in this space? How do we pursue opportunities? How do we optimize this so that we can continue to, to thrive and enjoy this, this beautiful city that we live in and uh, really um, optimize our, our impact, minimize our impact while being able to pursue our business ambitions? Um, so if you haven't yet set yourself a climate goal, that's your first step. Uh, definitely, that needs to be part of it. And then uh, you, you build that and set that goal as part of a broader business strategy. And, and then uh, I think we're all on the right track. But I'd be happy to hear more as well in terms of what others are thinking on this and what uh, some of the other panelists that are coming up now want, want to share with us in this space. Um, and then we can collaborate together to really make change. And um, I want to close on that. So thank you very much. And um, we're looking forward to the panel discussion. For your sharing. Now, may we invite the second keynote speaker for this session, Mr. Patrick Ho, Senior Manager of Sustainable Development at Swire Properties Limited. He will be sharing with us Swire's properties net zero journey. Mr. Ho, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, BC, for the invitation. And uh, very nice to see you all in, in person today after so long. And also wel uh, welcome to the online audience as well. Um, I'm Patrick, and I'm going to share this topic from ambition to action. Um, indeed, you know, Swire properties have come a very long way from setting um, our, our targets, you know, having actions to meet these targets. And indeed, these components are all very important, and they reinforce each other. So I hope my sharing will be useful to you, no matter what uh, sort of journey are you in, in your low carbon journey. So a bit of introduction to my properties. is a uh, developer, owner, and operator of a mixed use kind of you know, uh, retail, office, hotel, residential properties. And our major footprints, Hong Kong, Chinese mainland, Miami, USA, and also Southeast Asian countries. Uh, we are celebrating a 50 years of anniversary this year, um, and you know, quite recently we have in, uh, announced a you know major investment, 100 billion uh, investments, uh, new investment plan to expand our portfolio in Hong Kong, China, and Southeast Asia. And you know, so our core business, you know, is to uh, uh, developing and managing uh, green and sustainable buildings and communities. And uh, as of you know, last year, 100% um, of our major uh, new developments are all um, certified green buildings. And up to uh, last year, 96%, almost 100% of our all existing buildings are basically certified green buildings. But of course, this is not enough. We have to do a lot more to, for the net zero ambition. Um, Getting back to the topic, you know, we're talking about actions, right? So uh, my colleagues have very kindly helped me to, you know, map out some of the initiative and um, actions under, you know, so-called called a corporate climate action cycle. And there are four components under this cycle. There are four iterative components. First of all, the governance and strategy. And is, uh, I will talk about this later, about our um, ESG or Sustainable Development Strategy, or Sustainable Development SD, right, SD 2030. And under that, we have developed a climate uh, policy within which there are three components, mitigation, adaptation, resilience. So targets, we have broadly followed uh, the science-based target initiative to actually uh, define our decarbonization, decarbonization journey, you know, aligned with climate science at the scale and speed that's needed. And taking actions is a big component. It's spanned across a wide range of initiatives. Here you can see from green building development, we, we, we're setting this target against, you know, local system like Green Building Council's BIM Plus, internationally lead. Um, also, moving from green buildings, of course, we have to optimize and manage the buildings as sufficient as possible. So we are doing, you know, living a lot sort of technology innovations, retro commissioning works. And on technology adoption, we have a new, new venture um, departments, in-house departments actually to help us to source different, you know, global technology prop tech to help us to achieve that goal. And academia partnership is also important. So a name here is a Joint Research Center for Building Energy Efficiency and Sustainability, a, a center that we have established with Tsinghua University for, for more than a decade. And moving on to disclosure, we have been disclosing you know, a long list of, uh, like, like CLP Hendricks, right? Or, or, or whole, whole list of uh, disclosure. I think it's 
very important to get you know what we have been doing with the stakeholders, with investors, communicate properly what we have been doing. And also these indices, particularly like Dow Jones, has helped us to benchmark our performances uh, against our peers, against the industry, so that we can you know, uh, conduct continuous improvement. So backing up all these components is the green financing, so green bonds, loans, and sustainable link loans, and help us to support all these work. So as of last year, um, uh, around 30% of our uh, total bond and loan facilities on our properties is coming from green financing uh, instruments. So going to go, go, take you through some of these components. The first, the first one is the strategy. So back in 2016, our chief executive has already rekindled, you know, all sort of work we've been doing to build this new vision, right, to be the leading uh, sustainability performer in the real estate industry globally by 2030. It's a big, big vision, right? So. Under that, they have developed a, a, a strategy called SC2030. And, and this strategy actually has two purposes. It's to build sustainability capability across the whole firm, every department, every staff. And secondly, is to integrate sustainability consideration in you know, every uh, business decisions and business operations. And so under the SC2030, we have five components, right? The cent center one is centerpiece places. And we need people as a staff and our partners is very important. And that will help deliver two performance. One is economic performance. And the second one is environmental performance, which is particularly relevant today for the next zero topic. So to build, build on that, I, I think a robust, inclusive um, sustainability governance structure is what's important also to on the net zero agenda. So uh, leading from the top, from the board of directors, they are having the oversight of all the uh, climate-related issues and down to the uh, Social Development Steering Committee, which is chaired by our chief executive. And, and they also you know, uh, regularly you know, monitor the progress of the whole strategy, including the climate-related KPIs and, and strategies and, uh, and, and the action plans. So, and the, and the, one of the most important bit would be the five working groups, which compose of over 100 of uh, working group members, co colleagues from basically from different departments. And they are really the think tank to help us drive these actions, drive this initiative to to bring about results, to think about innovations, to think about you know, what's, what's missing, what we have to do more. So I think these are very important um, working group members. And for whole you know, normal employee level, 100% of our office staff basically have to align the appraisal and the goal setting with the, the, with the SE strategy. So this is quite amazing. So uh, since 2016, we have already made some progress. At 2020, the year 2020, we achieved you know, more than 80 uh, KPIs we have set ourselves, and we have it didn't stop there. We have established a uh, 40 plus new KPIs for the next decade. So uh, going to the target setting, I'm going to talk about a um, science-based target. This is, I think it is a game-changing um, target setting component that we have under the strategy. It's the uh, 1.5 line science-based target. So our, our science-based target history actually date back to 2019 where we was the first developer to actually have an validated and approved uh, two, two degree line science-based target. Um, and later, you know, last year, we ramped it up to 1.5 degree um, aligned science that also got approved. And it covers you know, scope one, scope two, and as well as scope three emissions. Cover our um, two major aspects. One is uh, upstream capital goods, that is the you know, development projects and body carbon. And the second one is our tenants emissions and other scope three emissions, which is also very key. I will talk about the scope three later in a more in-depth way. Right? So um, going back to the you know, carbon reduction hierarchy, I would like to say you know, uh, uh, there's so much companies right, in the, these two years have committed to net zero, right? Uh, but, I, but as a matter of fact, you know, we're seeing that you know, there is no you know, very you know, standardized approach to setting net zero targets. So a lot of companies are you know, having their own definition of scope and boundary and also the way to achieve this net zero target. So we will see there's a lot of skepticism indeed about the credibility and also the uh, scientific integrity of these natural targets to meet these targets. So, um, in particular, one concern is the you know excessive use of carbon offsets basically to meet the target. You know, without spending a lot of efforts on carbon reduction in the first place. So, Solar Properties is well aware of this um, difficulty and risk. So, this carbon reduction hierarchy helps us to you know you know stay more focused on you know reduction first as a priority. So we we'll do start out with uh, lower hang for light equipment placement, the old chillers, change to change, new, uh, new, more efficient chillers, for example. And then moving up to the, some, doing some you know, building-based optimization process like retro commissioning, um, monitoring say, commissioning works. And on tenant side, we'll do a lot of program software and hardware to help them to reduce their carbon emission. And then moving up to digitization, you know, this morning has talked a lot about this area. So we have been using this cloud-based 
management platform to help us to connect all the global portfolio to help us do the optimization and AI and digital monitoring. So moving up is the uh, more you know, adoption of emerging cutting edge technologies. A case in point is that this is a, a new pilot and Tidy Kuli signed it to a Beijing portfolio as a direct current uh, microgrid solutions where we adopt a lot of battery system uh, solar PV system connected with a direct grid current, which we are able to, you know, enhance the energy di distribution that, uh, efficiency by 10%. So this is a, a pilot in China, and the whole China, you know, commercial adoption. And after that, we'll explore to do as much as possible on-site renewables and also the off-site renewables. So Taiku Hui and Chengdu, uh, Guangzhou and Chengdu portfolio last, uh, in the past two years have been you know, able to source 100% renewable electricity. So now they're you know, net zero in their operations for both landlord and tenants. So we're looking forward to see more opportunities. So um, after such a commitment, we reported, right? So I'm reporting this, you know, in 2021, we have been making uh, quite steady progress in our science-based tariff scope one and scope two. We have been made, managed to reduce uh, 23%. Um, but uh, of course, this is partially of course, due, due to the energy reduction works we've been doing. So we've been able to, you know, having a, you know, absolute growth in GFA and growth of portfolio, but at the same time, our absolute uh, uh, um, energy consumption is still going down. So sort of decoupling our um, business growth with the, um, uh, with the energy impact. So, but we, uh, to hit the net zero, definitely we need to do more, for example, like more adoption, innovative technologies, and also for new, new development, having the net zero designs and, 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 and at the onset, and uh, increasing further from the current 19% of overall, you know, electricity global portfolio, or LG, uh, to bring it further up. So moving from scope one, scope two, and scope three, right? Um, so scope three equally important for us. Scope three constitutes around um, you know fifty percent of our whole you know total work score and scope two, scope three emissions. And there, are, this mapped out based on JG protocol to, to the various major um, scope three emissions. The, you will see the two bigger ones are uh, category thirteen, the downstream lease, as basically the tenants emissions of the green bit, and the, Blue bit category two is the embodied carbon from our new development projects. So I'm going to talk about tenants first. So uh, we have been taking these actions, right, to to help and to cover our, our tenants' emissions because tenants are important because they on a whole building set level they they constitute around 40% of the energy consumption of a whole building, and also in terms of waste generation they're around 90% of it coming from from tenants. So as as a hotspot. So we're offering these different programs, um, like tenant free energy audit for them to identify energy reduction initiative, uh, tenant power metering, and also green kitchen initiative. Basically, we help some of the F and B tenants to design a green as possible uh, kitchen as much as possible. That's very well received. And on recycling, um, in particular, to uh, mention this. Um, uh, a circular furniture program, right? So, so it's helping, basically helping a moving out tenant to recycle their furniture and then become the resource for the incoming tenants. So it's sort of, you know, a trading platform which helps that to reduce that, you know, fitting out waste. So last but not least, it's a smart waste reduction pilot, basically using a, 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 a smart scale in store under individual recycling bin and waste bin that will actually feed the data into cloud system and then you know display very intuitively on our dashboard so that the so that the tenants employees will be very aware of how much they recycle, how much they produce a waste. And this program very particularly successful. They have helped these tenants to reduce 14% of waste per employee. And also overall they achieve a very high waste diversion rate uh, being 41%. So and another game-changing initiative we just rolled out this year is this is called the GPP, Green Performance Pledge. Uh, this is developed based on a basic premise of a green lease, and it's involved, you know, cover the whole tenancy cycle from fit out, fit out uh, renovation until into the operation phase. So uh, basically, tenants joining would have to, you know, submit data, data sharing, and also we provide a lot of, you know, land or provide a lot of, you know, engineering solution, technology solutions, and it's also benchmarking, data benchmarking service for them. So um, from the fit out, we have, you know, we, we make sure they follow, you know, our SD fit out guide so that they can design an office to it which is green and sustainable as much as possible. And then throughout the operational phase, they share data with us, we'll benchmark their water consumption, waste generation, energy consumption. By through that, we don't do management and give awards and also help you know, those performing not so well to, to improve over time. So up to now, since launch, we have already got 
21% of you know, the East floor area of all Hong Kong offices joining, around 1.7 million of this tenanted area joining, and we set target to hit 50% by 2025. So I'm going to talk to you through another uh, scope three emissions, is the embodied carbon. So uh, this is a case study of two Taiko place. This is under development. You come to Kauri Bay area. It's, it's almost finished this year. So it's, it's a, a redevelopment project under the you know, Taiko place area. It's uh, uh, very green as a snow building. So it's a beam plus lead and well sort of platinum certified. And the history, you know, go back to 2016, where we redeveloped three industrial buildings into two um, new commercial buildings. The first one being one Taiko place that was actually uh, completed in 2018, and now the uh, two Taiko place. So uh, in, in addition to these buildings, we're also, you know, building a lot of amenities, sustainable amenities around the area, like the connection bridges, foot bridges to connect, make the p place more walkable and connect, connect up uh, much better. And also we are introducing yeah, a lot more um, greeneries in the area. So this is uh, a landscape, this is a, a still, still rendering photo, but uh, I think by the end of this year, if you come, you will have to enjoy this uh, green space. So uh, these are, these little trees, we have to do a lot of, you know, biodiversity uh, study with Hong Kong U. We actually select, you know, some native feng shui woodland tree species to enhance the biodiversity value. So that's actually create a green corridor uh, with the Cory Park Country Park with the Cory uh, Bay Park at the forefront, in, in the middle is the Taiku Place area. So that you know, birds and butterflies will be able to you know, uh, use the, utilize this space as a, as a green corridor. So we're also introducing a 25 kilometers uh, wind corridor, bringing in the sea breezes from, from the sea into the Taiku Bay area. So that will actually help enhance the thermal comfort and reduce around you know, two degrees for uh, Celsius for, for the area. That's just make the place more livable and enjoyable. So for two type place, for a typical floor, we're having that you know, three meter wide panoramic facade. And also, you know, it's a good, very good performance glass that has a very good um, um, shading coefficient that we able to, that means we are able to, you know, uh, maintain a very good thermal comfort while, you know, allowing more natural daylight to get into the building. So in terms of, you know, whole life cycle management, we are having, you know, the whole life cycle considerations, you know, back from structural optimization, um, where we've been using BIM models to actually allow us to use more prefab and modulized elements mm -hmm. when building. And also we're procuring a lot of low carbon building materials, like 100% of the concrete are uh, actually certified by uh, Construction Industry Council to be uh, you know, platinum performance in, in terms of carbon content and with great recycled content. The same case uh, applies to structural steel and weed bar. These two are the major hotspots in terms of upfront and body carbon. So renewable energy, two type place would be able to generate around 7% of the total landlord energy used from renewable. From a biodiesel tri-generation plant, we, we, we recycle waste, uh, waste oils to make biodiesel and then burn there and also for PV system and a wind turbine. So we have, of course, this is a, also a key component for the operational phase, how we use this system, sort of like a digital plane, using IoT technologies to collect data, millions of data, um, day to day, and then do the big data analysis to use the op uh, automatic optimization to help us to you know, for, uh, keep up the, the, the energy performance of the buildings. So um, after we, uh, you know, uh, despite we're do, doing a lot, you know, on reducing carbon emission, but we have to get prepared for the climate resilience because, you know, the climate impact is still going to affect us significantly. And that's why we have been doing the climate risk assessment for our global portfolios following the, you know, four different climate scenarios for our for global portfolio. And so far, as, um, we have been able to identify not, not so much low to moderate risk level for our global portfolios. But of course, we identify these short and long term measures for individual buildings to mitigate the risk. Just share one example to, to close up. Um, it's in the Miami portfolio. Miami City, if you've been there, you know that place is you know, very famous, vulnerable to uh, flooding, tropical, rain, tropical uh, cyclone, you know, and uh, sort of things. So very famous. So uh, Sri Properties have been working for a you know, public-private partnership with the government um, to actually propose a solution to, to enhance the sea level resilience. You can see on the top left um, with a photo with the sea wall, seven meter sea wall. This is the original sea wall proposed by the US Army Corporation of Engin Engineers. So I probably think that you know, this is not so good, all right? So we, we kind of propose a nature-based solutions, you know, basically making up a wetland, uh, oyster reef, and some planters to act as a natural barrier 
to dissipate wave energy in case there's a flooding event. So this plan was um, meeting all engineering requirements, while, but also pro provide a lot of social value so that people can get access to the coastline while you know, enjoying the economic opportunities um, in the area. So later, the, the government, Miami government actually uh, uh, reject the original plan. All right, they, so they now revisit the plan with incorporation of more nature-based solutions into the design. So we're very happy to get involved in this partnership and we hope, hopefully we can see these more examples in Hong Kong and in the region. So to close up, um, time is up, I know. So um, if, if you have more, what, 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 why don't you visit our survey report? So to conclude, I think um, getting net zero is important and it needs every one of us to get involved from target setting, from taking science-based actions, from you know, public engagement from, with your stakeholders, and also, last but not least, a positive mindset. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ho, for sharing the many and interesting initiatives at Swire Properties. Now we can start our panel discussion. As a reminder, online participants are welcome to use the Q&A box if you have any questions for our speakers. For audience in the room, please raise your hands and we will pass you the mic. Now, please welcome our moderator, Mr. Merlin Lau, Head of Policy and Research at BEC. Merlin, over to you, please. Can I be heard? Yeah. Uh, actually, we, we have three more seats. Uh, we, we have three more panelists to join us. Uh, we have Clara Chan from Niki, uh, and then we have uh, Elin from Modern Terminals, and then we have Feng Yuan from H&M. Please. Uh, before I start, I just want to make sure, uh, Hendrik, are you, are you with us? Yes, right. I, I, mean, I, 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 I see, see you me. push the <laughs> button. Okay. Um, yeah. Go. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Merlin. Um, to actually uh, set the scene further, I, I, I want to add a few works here. So I, I think we have a good uh, lineup of panelists actually representing uh, various sectors. We have power sector, we have property um, development, and then we have a uh, metallic uh, raw material industry. Uh, cargo terminal and also faction. So um, for me, um, th the question is uh, actually we three years ago or four years ago we still talk about low carbon, but and then now we transition to next zero, and and the speed is really really fast, and and there's a lot to be done. Uh, I'm trying to coming from a perspective that by bringing into a uh, different um, like industry player and see how they are doing things may be the same, may be differently, and actually the lessons can be uh, like uh, learned by the others who haven't started the journey or actually you have similar things to do. Yeah, so this is just a little bit background. Um, maybe to, to start with, uh, I, I want to uh, talk to Kara first. Um, so uh, Kara, like uh, Leaky, is a metallic uh, raw material industry, and we know uh, uh, metallic industry can be quite energy intensive, and actually internationally, uh, there are more uh, international pressure calling for decarbonization of the sector, and I'm sure uh, Leaky would be under some pressure. So uh, maybe tell us a little bit more about you, uh, how you work on this. Yeah. Sure, thank you. I think the general perceptions of the metal industry is uh, very energy in intensive and, um, and not carbon friendly at all. And then, um, so um, at Li Qi, we do have our production facilities in Hong Kong. We do actually produce raw materials in Hong Kong. Um, so um, being a uh, supplier uh, of the uh, more of the upstream of the metals value chain, um, we take um, carbon decarbonizations very seriously. So when I look at it, we, uh, I want to um, share our story into two parts, internal and external. I'll start with internal first. Um, I think uh, we, the governance is very important for any companies that uh, want to start with the uh, decarbonization journey. Um, at Leaky, we take this uh, net zero target um, from swipe from the top from the board, and then we set the goal. 
and we make sure that the message is transparent and open across all our organizations. So it is not only a one department's uh, job. It is actually the whole company needs to work together. So, um, so we set this as uh, our culture, and we have different uh, sustainability working teams across uh, our staff from different regions and from different functions that we share ideas on how do we work towards to our goal. And we also monitor the, uh, the process along the way. Secondly, is uh, we deploy a lot of technology. Um, as I mentioned, we have production facilities in Hong Kong, and uh, we work, use, uh, utilize a lot of uh, industry 4.0 technologies to help us to improve production efficiency and also to monitor our energy usage and, and have a feedback loop so that uh, to constantly uh, using real-time data for us to analyze how to make it uh, more efficiently, especially, especially from the energy side. And on the external side, um, we believe that um, the um, decarbonization does not work only by us, ourselves, and we have to talk to our upstream, our suppliers, and also our customers, our downstream customers. So um, we um, have our pro uh, sustainable procurement policy. We work with international smelters and miners, making sure that the materials that they deliver to us or the production process also complied with the uh, with our policy and also the um, environmental um, standard and uh, and then we talk to our uh, customers and we actually for every production batch that we produce in Hong Kong we disclose our carbon intensity data making sure that our customers who are mostly SMEs uh, the manufacturers of many uh, consumable products that they can use this data for their own productions so I think the data transparency for the whole um, for the along the value chain is also very important so that the whole industries can work together. And lastly is uh, we want to bring industry awareness. Um, we uh, do a lot of uh, uh, sharings and also seminars with our customers and also along our value chain so that the, 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 the carbon net zero uh, target can be achieved not only for one uh, uh, sector in the value chains but for the whole um, uh, the value chain. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. Um, maybe now I can turn to Elin. Uh, actually, we, we know uh, modern terminals, you, you have set a um, 2030 uh, like operation uh, GHG emission elimination target. So maybe you can tell us uh, quite a bit uh, of what you have been doing. And maybe one more thing is uh, we are not just talking about 2030, we are talking about until 2050 and beyond the current plan to operational emission, and, and how are you going to prepare you uh, for 2050? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, before I answer your questions, I just want to introduce our company briefly so as to set the context. Uh, we are a container terminal uh, operator, so um, basically we handle containers, and we opened the first purpose-built uh, container terminals in Hong Kong. In fact, we are celebrating our 50 years uh, anniversary. And that is not only our anniversary because we opened the first purpose-built container terminals in Hong Kong. So it's the 50th anniversary of the container port in Hong Kong. Um, we emphasize a lot on sustainability, which is uh, reflect on in our uh, mission. Uh, and we start our sustainability uh, journey long time ago. And last year, we uh, established our sustainability strategy with long-term goals because throughout the years, we have been doing a lot of initiatives and, uh, and, and programs. And last year, we just want to look at, okay, what's next? I mean, how, how can we bring our company to the next level? That's why we established the strategies covering various uh, aspects. And for environment or for decarbonizations, we have uh, set targets to eliminate all our direct emissions uh, from operations by 2030 and to become carbon neutral by 2050. Um, so 
how are we going to do that? As I mentioned, we emphasize a lot on sustainability, and a lot of our equipments uh, at our terminals have already been uh, powered by electricity, including our key crane, our uh, rubber tie country cranes, which uh, handle uh, containers within the yard area. What we need to do now to achieve our 2030 goal is to identify appropriate equipment and vehicles, especially light goods vehicles, heavy goods vehicles, um, to, uh, to identify uh, appropriate uh, vehicles and equipment powered by green energy and at the same time meet our operational needs because we operate 24 hours nonstop. 365 days a year. So we have to ensure those vehicles can support our operation. Um, when we made our uh, commitment last year, um, there, there was no direct, uh, immediate solution. So we are working on it. And um, uh, in fact, we will soon uh, announce that. I mean, we, 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 we are taking delivery of two uh, electric light goods vehicles and two electric Ford lift for our trial. And besides that, uh, we are also looking at renewable energy. We finished uh, the first phase of our solar panel system installation last year. Uh, and so far, every, we estimate that every year we can reduce, we, we can produce uh, about uh, 140,000 kilowatt hours of electricity and we have more phase to come. And also, I mean, go, uh, looking for ahead, I mean, uh, to achieve our 2050 uh, goal, we also uh, need to look at, I mean, how to offset, uh, uh, because if we eliminate all our uh, direct emission from our operations, then uh, how to offset uh, the, 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 the rest, um, uh, to become carbon neutral, so um, we we like to, we 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 is in an early stage, but we like to look at projects uh, rather than just uh, find a carbon offset uh, platform and then offset it. So, uh, but as I said, uh, it's in a very early stage, uh, so it's uh, still a lot of work uh, for us to do. Thank you. Yeah, definitely, we we talk about reduction. Uh, not offset at the moment. Um, so yeah, and I, I think the challenge for you really lies on technology, which is uh, what we discussed in, in section two this morning as well. Uh, I, I will pass the floor to Feng Yuan uh, from H&M. Uh, so we know like everyone knows H&M uh, has global production lines and, and there are two experts. You have this uh, target across the whole value chain so how do you ensure this value chain, uh, like uh, your partners, are aligned with your goal? And at the same time, you, you have multi-country like office teams. And internally, how do you also align this? So it's more like internal and also on your like a value chain. How, how do you work on that? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Merlin. Um, so basically at H&M, we have communicated our long-term climate goals with all our business partners and, and suppliers uh, that we want to reach net zero across our value chain by 2040. Uh, so we know it needs to happen at a pace of halving our emission every decade. And you know, uh, most of the emissions reductions uh, that is needed uh, will come from phasing out of fossil fuels within our supply chain. Uh, Currently, coal is the largest um, contributor to our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, so we have seen suppliers, you know, using uh, coal to produce electricity and, and then produce steams and hot waters. You know, that's you know how this coal become a bigger share of emission. Um, you know, and, and we see that you know we uh, we we need to find a way. Uh, to uh, phase out, and then internally we have set an uh, ambition uh, or aim uh, to phase out our on-site coal uh, in, in facilities that produce our product uh, by 2025, and we have been asking suppliers to start considering you know, doing the same. 
um, we have take uh, you know we took the first step uh, this year, and so basically we call it stop the bleeding. Uh, you know, starting January uh, 2022, we have stopped onboarding any new supplier or production facilities that have coal boilers on site. Um, but we also know that this is not enough. So to ensure that our existing uh, supply chain partners, you know, also aligned, you know, with our climate goals, we're now asking all suppliers to set a facility level um, 2030 climate uh, roadmap, starting with the most strategic suppliers uh, in each production countries, and we offer them, you know, programs and, and finance uh, to reach this goal. Uh, that's you know, how we communicate and align our goals externally with our supplier partners. And internally, we have also been aligning our, you know, group production climate roadmaps in basically for the supply chain organization, you know, with our premium brands and, and assortment uh, teams and functions. And of course, you know, brand and assortment, they can have their own uh, climate strategy and, and areas of focus in their strategy, you know, for example, whether they want to focus more on energy efficiency or renewable energy or have uh, kind of a priority market. Um, but at the end of the day, um, they all hold accountable for achieving and you know, contributing to the group climate goals. And we are introducing a internal carbon pricing model uh, to change the internal behavior and uh, for example you know by putting a price on, on carbon uh, we are trying to steer you know more business toward you know renewable and sustainable source to materials and also you know greener supply chain uh, partners I think that's how we kind of align this goal internally thank you uh, now we went through one round uh, I have some questions on on the IPEC but uh, I, I actually would like to ask a question to, to all the panelists. Uh, just now we talked about different pledges. You're asking your upstream, downstream to do things. Um, but very importantly, how, how you make sure your pledges and actions and outcomes are aligned. Like what is the sort of like governing or actually monitoring mechanism in, in your corporate? What happened if non-compliance? Just now we talked about we, we think things will be compliant. But actually, in reality, it may not be combined. So, so uh, it's quite open the floor, and and we open to the panelists to answer. But I want to particularly ask Hendrik first because uh, the energy intensity of COP, if it's not meeting the target, then it means everyone else here is not meeting the target. <laughs> so, so uh, Hendrik. Uh, thanks, Merlin. Yeah, um, fair point. I appreciate that, but I think compliance is not the right word. Um, I think what we're looking at, and I, that's what the point I was trying to make earlier, is really about meeting your business strategy objective. And, and not just taking the CLP context, but just more broadly, you set yourself climate targets, and, and these are not just out of thin air. These are targets that reflect your ambitions, but also your they need to be grounded in reality, right? They need to be grounded on, on, on what, you can, what you think you can do as an organization and what systems you put in place, what technology you intend to deploy, what areas of your business you would like to see grow. And, you know, we all make business plans. They get updated regularly. Every company has a business plan. Sometimes it doesn't work the way you intended it to work, right? I mean, it, there's other externalities that impact your, your business. And if you look at the, the environment that we currently operate in, there's certainly a lot of challenges. Um, supply chain being one of them, energy costs being another, for instance. Um, so it, it, it is really fundamentally about putting systems in place annually to track your progress to keep your target in mind and to make sure that you can continually review and shift your strategy in order to, uh, to meet those targets. And, and for us, we, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a two-step process. One is the external tracking and performance uh, measurement and, 
and what we disclose uh, to the market. And one is uh, an internal process we have in place to make sure that uh, the various business units actually follow through with the various commitments we have in terms of phasing out certain assets by a certain date, investing in more renewables by a certain time frame and a certain quantity, or even um, building uh, new business opportunities in terms of energy services and uh, our progress in, in that regard. So, so that's, that's, that's something that happens at a very granular level internally as part of our annual business uh, planning process. And at the same time, we then report back to the market on an annual basis of where we've made progress and where we haven't yet made progress and where we intend to do more. Um, so yeah, it's not compliance. It's, it's really tracking your, your, your business plan and your business strategy. Uh, that's, that's how I would uh, frame that. Um, and yeah, hopefully that answers yeah. the question. Yeah. Thank you for correcting me. Uh, anyone else want to respond to this uh, about this monitoring? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Patrick. Yeah, thank thank you for the question. Um, I'm going to try to echo Hendrik's point. You know, for for us, I mean, you know, there's a target we have to meet it, but that's not enough, right? Because you know, we have a mindset is just a hitting target. You know, comply with it. it. It won't be sustainable, and it won't drive value. So so for for us, it's more in, you know trying to integrate that concept. You know, climate risk and climate opportunities in the same time, how the climate opportunities would mean to our different staff and different departments and every, you know, job and work they're doing. For example, like for our, for our finance department, how the climate risk uh, would present, you know, um, the, the, you know, the future um, investability of, of, the, of the stock of soil properties and how, you know, green financing would able, actually able to offer them more uh, investor interest in our green bonds and how, you know, the currently do we have a, a few you new know, sustainable link loans that link to our energy performance with our buildings. I think that's, you know, that is something that, you know, if we can hit the target, we could, can perform well, that would help them to create that financing in, uh, influence. And so for our buildings, I think a lot of the uh, staff, are, you know, leasing team, you know, they, they're talking to tenants. It's important that, you know, they understand that you know, climate consideration, ESG considerations are so commonplace now. You know, all the tenants are asking for it. They want to house the stuff in a, a certified green building, energy efficient building. They want to the landlord to have some sort of like a, a green performance flash to help them to improve the energy performance so that they hit their own science based tire or their own, you know, uh, uh, carbon objectives. So it's more like, you know, integrating that concept with our leasing team colleagues, you know, learn, let them to understand, you know, what, what the climate transition would bring to our, our business as you know, you know how to make make your um, you know your your offices your retail shops more you know uh, able to transition into the climate you know restrained future I think that's that is able to help them to you know to understand you know what are the opportunities for my job and for the departments to to gain that you know market competitiveness so I think it's from our so our properties we have gone through so a lot of lessons not not so not a lot of them are successes but I think well, I think it's, it's more important to for, for me I feel is is the I integration internalize you know the climate consideration with your different departments uh, so that it becomes part of the you know also to share the same goal and objective that would be making the job a bit, little bit easier thank you Anyone? Yeah, um, we have a similar experience too. The, from a point of view, it's like like the two panelists have shared. It's a business strategies and risk management. It's not something that the companies can choose whether you like to do it or not. Or not. It's actually you have to do it. But once you set the target and then uh, make sure it's transparent, it's uh, throughout the whole companies understands the target, and then uh, constantly review, monitor, and then env business environment uh, environment changes and there are challenges as well. And sometimes we need to go back and then. Um, set the goals uh, to be more realistic, and then, and then just try to improve and working towards it. I think this is this is the way that how we work as well. Mm. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, at uh, modern terminals, um, we think that mean uh, engaging everyone is very important because we it's our people who help us to achieve what we want to achieve. And, and also, uh, immediately after we establish our sustainability strategies, we have uh, developed a detailed work plan in covering every aspect of sustainability, not only environment. And for each initiative, uh, the work plans covered last year and this year. 
And for each, uh, each initiative, uh, there's a, um, a responsible owner and also manager. And then uh, we, depending on the scale and, and the nature of the initiatives, I mean, uh, it's related to uh, part of our business plan, uh, KPIs or functional initiatives, which are related to our bonuses. And also, uh, we, we have to have regular update to our sustainability steering committee. So uh, we can monitor the progress. And later this year, I mean, we have to look at uh, updating the work plan to cover uh, next year. So, so in a way, we, 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 we will continue to have a, a close monitoring um, of the progress uh, in order to have to ensure that we can achieve what we uh, want to achieve. I combine a question. Uh, actually, I, I think it's really relevant because you mentioned about internal carbon pricing. Is that also one of the mechanisms that, that you safeguard the process? Maybe you can combine the answer if you can. Sure, I think that's that definitely one, one of the, the, the tools that we're using to, um, you know, to uh, reach our target. Uh, I think um, at H&M, basically, we, um, we don't own any production facility and, and over 70% of our emission is actually coming from our supply chain. So, so you know, in order to, to make sure that, you know, we can work with support our suppliers to, to reach the goal, you know, in turn, and that they help us reach our goal, our scope three emission target. And you know, we have been, you know, working on two things. So one is to make technical resources available. And one uh, second one is to make financial resources available to support our suppliers. So for example, we have identified some of the, uh, the most important levers for emissions reduction uh, in our supply chain. Uh, you know, one of them is energy efficiency improvement. Uh, so over the past two years, we have been building an in-house energy expert team. So now we have at least one energy efficiency expert, expert in uh, the top six production markets. Um, so they are the ones who are on the ground, you know, driving our energy efficiency project in factories and provide the technical support um, to our suppliers. And, 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 and right now we are also making a, um, a separate budget available, which is not the sustainability budget, it's a green investment budget. You know, through our green investment budget, you know, we are now financing um, innovative technologies like solar thermal, and also, you know, biomass uh, in production facilities, you know, to help them transition from, from fossil fuels to uh, renewable energy. So I think those are the, uh, the things that we see that, you know, uh, it's critical for us to, to reach the goal. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I want to jump to the IPEC uh, for actually quite specific question uh, to Kara. Um, so we, we talk about metal industry and actually just now Patrick mentioned the case of embodied carbon. So at Leaky Group, like how, how do you see the embodied carbon uh, portfolio? Like how do you going to manage that uh, in, in your work in your future? And uh, actually a follow up question on that is like, because of this requirement uh, for decarbonization, how do you see the pricing and the market uh, in terms of your production in Hong Kong? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of uh, talk, especially in metal industries, uh, because as the raw material suppliers, we also we always hear a lot of uh, the comments from our customers that they are buyer, ultimate customers, looking for uh, recycled materials and that will reduce carbon and 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 all that. But but um, it's for us uh, because uh, we have the expertise in these areas. Uh, we 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 like to clarify that it's actually sometimes some of the products can. Use recycled materials, but actually, some other products may, recycled ma materials may not be a good choice. But but in any case, that you can choose alternatively, you can choose uh, to have uh, some of the low carbon uh, metals raw materials, and that leads to the um, uh, the cost issue. And uh, uh, at this. The current market, if you if uh, the demand comes from the uh, uh, the low carbon uh, metals products, is actually the the price could be higher uh, than uh, 
conventional materials uh, because of the um, uh, the setup of the productions and the energy usage and all that. So um, I, I think eventually when the demand is getting uh, higher than uh, the, the cost could be uh, have the possibilities to become lower, but this could be a, a more of the uh, uh, longer term that we need to uh, we need to wait and see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take one more question from the iPad um, from the online audience. So, a uh, question to Feng Yuan. Uh, could you share how far H&M goes in terms of supply engagement beyond tier one or tier two suppliers, or how far you really go? Yeah. I think that's a very good question. I think traceability is always a challenge. Uh, you know, we have over a thousand suppliers globally. Um, so, I would say we are now covering um, all the tier one um, suppliers and, and most of our tier twos in, in a third party verified kind of a, um, uh, audit uh, scheme uh, through the HIG FEM. You know, so we're collecting data also you know, through our internal systems and platforms and which is also third party verified. So I think if, for that, I mean, it's um, been really, really helping us to understand uh, you know, have the primary you know, energy data from our uh, tier one and tier two suppliers. So we can closely monitor uh, their environment, environmental performance. And uh, of course, you know, the raw material side is also uh, a large source of our emissions. We have also been in trying to engage with the raw material suppliers at the farm level. But I think in between um, the spinners and, and weavers, uh, those our tier three and tier fours are kind of been we're, we're less engaged, but we're trying to um, build the full traceability uh, throughout our value chain. And there's there was a uh, target, you know, uh, we can have the full traceability to um, our tier three spinner level by the end of this year. Thank you. Uh, on site audience, uh, any any questions uh, from anyone? Other otherwise, I will go back to online. Okay. I yeah. Um, I think this question applies to all panelists. So um, it's asking like, I would like to see how communication is being channeled to actually all working level people uh, when uh, implementing uh, the targets and the corporate strategy in uh, carbon reduction. So I, I think the keyword here is like, not people of us like who, who already have the awareness, but to the working level people, um, open open to panelists who, who, who would like to answer this? Anyone? Maybe I can share my, some of my experience. Uh, um, we actually talk to every staff. Uh, of course, not, not in one session, but in different uh, sessions and uh, from management to workers level and um, making sure that they under, understand and then by just one, one meeting would not be enough. So we constantly have a lot of training. Um, sometimes we need to gamify the training so that uh, everyone uh, understands the terminologies, first of all, and then how we each of us can participate in the whole journey. And... To us, it's like uh, similar to like uh, other kinds of like company trainings. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Mm. Okay. I want to add. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm talking about one one experience for for frontline staff. You know, if you come come to our office, um, if you see our building services frontline, okay, we won't talk about you know GHG protocol science based target with them, but we create actually create a pin like that. I'm wearing this today. Uh, 1.5. They're wearing it, you know. And the frontline staff, you can imagine, right? So, so we will actually ta talk them through, you know, what does that mean? 1.5 is the, you know, kind of commitment of the company to reach a, you know, 1.5 degree world. And they are now carrying that, you know, like an ambassador. Um, when the visitors go to our offices, you know, they 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 feel proud of it. You know, they feel, you know, um, Swarp Properties is a responsible company, and you know, they're also doing the part to help communicate a message with, with the public, with the office tenants, with the, with the shopping malls visitors. I think this is uh, kind of a, a, a good way for um, by our communication team to actually think of that idea using a pin to, to demonstrate commitment. Right. Okay. Um, 
Do you want to respond? I just want yeah. to add that. I mean, um, I think it's important to make the topic uh, as part of the day-to-day -day, um, communications within the company. I mean, not just focus on something or, or, or within a short period of time. I mean, um, our company focuses a lot on internal communications. We have uh, a lot of channels for communications, uh, including two-way communication. So I think we just need to keep the topic as one of the important topics among the, the discussions. That's important. OK. Thank you, everyone. Uh, one more question. Um, question to Hendrik. So uh, there are so many digital units within CLP. So how you really put all the pieces within CLP together to achieve the goal that you have set? Mm, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but when you say digital units. I think um, business lines, maybe. Yeah, right. I mean, so if we take that as a sort of basis for the question, um, for us, it was really important to um, work with each of the business units to understand what they have in mind in terms of growing the business or transforming the business. And and it's sort of, a, a, um, it's two pieces. One is our generation portfolio, and, and that includes anything from thermal to, to renewables, um, nuclear as well. And then one is the energy services side of the business. So for us, it was, it has been traditionally, and that's for most utilities, a big focus on the generation side of things. And that's what our current targets uh, reflect. It's the electricity that we send to customers at the end of the day. That, that's what we need to decarbonize. That's our core product. And what we're looking at now is actually more on the energy services side. And what, what sort of implications does that have for our current um, greenhouse gas portfolio um, our footprint? And how do we need to shift? How much are we actually helping our customers decarbonize? That's, that's the next iteration of our targets in terms of how do we quantify that? Uh, how can we set ourselves targets to help customers uh, from that perspective? Um, I'm not sure if that really answers the question, but... Um, yeah, we, we take that as an answer. Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, I don't get clarification from there, so, so I assume you answer it well. Uh, maybe, I, I think we are in the interest of time, I, I would sort of like jump to a last question. I try to convert what, what we discussed. We talk about communication, we talk about target, we talk about all the initiative. And, and for all the firms and corporate here, I think we are in the more like pioneering side of the journey. Actually, uh, we, have, um, like, we have a BEC, we have this uh, low carbon charter. In Hong Kong, there are many SMEs. So many of them, they haven't really uh, started any of the journey. So from your experience, uh, not, not too long, I mean, in the last few years, w what is the one most um, important aspect that you would advise like a business to pay attention when they start to navigate their climate journey? Yeah, uh, the question is to everyone here. Yeah. Uh, okay. Please. <laughs> um, um, I, I, I would say the most important thing is to engage everyone. Um, um, I'm personally very passionate about sustainability. And um, I believe it's important for more people uh, in the company, if not all, I mean, to be passionate as, as well. Once a person is passionate about that, I mean, he or she will always look for opportunities, uh, no matter it's big or small. Um, we can always start from something small and then eventually grow it back, um, I think. But, but the pa passion is very important, yeah. Um, I think commitment from the top management is very important, um, especially for SMEs when uh, we don't have a lot of resources within the company. And some of the SMEs may think this is part of the uh, one department's job. And, but uh, but this is not actually the case, and um, 
And so make sure that is the commitment from the top, communicate throughout the organization. And then, um, and this has been a lot of talk about the, the costs of uh, of doing it, uh, maybe having another equipment or the, and uh, we have also have challenges in uh, getting the talents from the market. But I think um, we do have these challenges, uh, but I think uh, the, the Again, it's, uh, it's not the choice whether you want to do it or not, because if we, if we, if we don't start the journey, uh, we, we will lose the competitiveness in the long run. So uh, perhaps it's better to start sooner than later and, uh, and then just work towards the target step by step. Mm. I, would say they, I would say they would they should join BC Low Carbon Charter <laughs> in the first place. Thank seek, you very seek, much. Seek for guidance. Um, well, um, and right after that, maybe I'm trying to do a carbon accounting for, for the operation. Maybe it's a scope one, scope two accounting to understand the impact of the operations. Yeah, and then set target to reduce it over time. Yes. Um, I think for us, you know, many of our suppliers are SMEs. Uh, I think for us, it's important that we, we shake hands with our suppliers on our climate and goals and roadmaps. And traditionally, we have been taking a very top-down approach to set target for suppliers, um, you know, but during the actual implementation uh, phase, you know, you really have to, to do it from bottom up and together with suppliers and get our hands dirty. And so it's important really to, to see where, you know, our top down goals meets the bottom up, um, you know, action plan, you know, from supplier. And if we see there's a gap, uh, we need to find a way to, to close it, you know, whether it's, we need to bring in you know, financial solutions or kind of technologies you know, to support them uh, and, and us um, to, to together achieve our goals. Uh, Hendrik, you, you want to add uh, some word? Um, sure, I mean, I think a lot of it has been covered already, but uh, I mean, fundamentally, um, it is about a recognition that this is a, a risk management piece. It is, um, it is, to the core of a business. It is about understanding where your carbon footprint is. So the carbon accounting piece is very fundamental. Um, depending on what kind of product you make, what you bring to the market, you really need to get to the bottom of, of where the carbon footprint is. And, and through that process, then zoom in. You need to have that willingness to not just communicate around this, but really get to the bottom of the, the problem uh, from a technical perspective. How do you make your product where do you have potential to reduce carbon intensity? And do you have alternative <clears throat> raw materials, alternative processes? What are the cost implications of changing? And uh, how does this actually help you to continue to uh, run your business, to continue to your uh, meet your commitments for the bottom line, while at the same time actually reducing the carbon intensity and then reducing your carbon or climate risks? So it's that it just needs to have that bigger picture approach. It, it doesn't. That's your starting point. If you if you're starting off with, uh, well, we need to get the, um, we need to get our colleagues online, and and we all need to sort of. I mean, I'm just gonna be cheeky about this. We, it's not about holding hands and let's all do the right thing. It, it's about business. It's about um, really getting to the bottom of uh, how do we fix this, so that your business has viability in the medium to long term as well if, if you want to start from a real selfish corporate perspective thank you thank you um we are really running out of time i i tried to conclude today's section uh actually we talk a lot about things of uh, mitigation and and it's all about carbon but now it's different from a few years ago then it's not just about the carbon we just now mentioned again business competitiveness and then risk management is the big picture is bigger than when conventional environmental people are talking things. So this is uh, somewhere we are going. And uh, taking the science based target the same, three years ago we talked about two degree, and then uh, Patrick already mentioned 1.5, and then we're going to next zero. So the implication to business sectors are actually really moving really, really fast, and we just need more such kind of conversation going on about how we do things and, and, and let each other learn. So with this, I, I would just uh, want to thank you, uh, our panelists today, and please give them a, a round uh, of applause. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much.
Thank you again. This marks the end of the third session.